What's up everybody, I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are here to talk about a very interesting band, which is Electric Callboy, or as you may have known them in the past, Eskimo Callboy. And yes, I will talk about that later in the video. And if you're like most people, you may know this band for their crazy over the top music videos that get tens of millions of views. For example, Hypa Hypa, which as of now is sitting over 26 million views. Pretty amazing for a metal band from a small city in Germany, right? But what I find really interesting about them is that although a lot of people will probably think of them as a newer band that just blew up off of Hypa Hypa and Pump It over the past couple years, the band has actually been around for over a decade now with a ton of success over in Germany. It's only just now that they're starting to get more awareness in North America. And I'm always fascinated by bands like this. For example, Lorna Shore and Ice Nine Kills. Any of these bands that have their breakthrough moment many, many years into their career, because honestly, it kind of gives hope to any of us trying to make something happen in our own lives and careers, wondering if maybe it's too late. And they're proof that the answer is no, it's never too late. So in this video, I'm going to try to do my very best to answer the question of exactly how they did it and what was that breakthrough moment and to answer the question that a lot of people including me had in the past are they more than just like a cartoonish party metal band but first if you haven't please check out my spotify playlist i add new songs every couple days updated constantly with new stuff in all kinds of genres and there's a link to that in the description of this video and also today's sponsor is public.com which is an investing app where you can invest in stocks etfs and and crypto. What I love about public is that it helps people become better investors. I joined public and you can see what trends I follow. Just search for at Finn McKenty in the app. You can also follow other investors and share ideas. You can find people like Philip DeFranco and Graham Stephan, who I'm a huge fan of. There's also Cody Ko and Shelby Church and thousands more on the app. And on public, you can trade thousands of stocks, ETFs and crypto, including Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano, Doge, Shiba Inu, and more. And there are no commissions on standard stock trades. Plus, Public does not sell your trades to market makers, unlike certain other investment apps. They route the trades directly to the exchanges. So if you want to check out Public, you'll get a free stock worth three to $1,000 when you go to public.com slash punk rock or hit the link in the description of this video and create an account. Get started today. Once again, make sure you go to public.com slash punk rock to get a free stock worth three to $1,000 or hit the link in the description of this video. And in order to really understand who Electric Cowboy is, we have to start at the very beginning because although a lot of people do think of them as a newer band, Electric Cowboy actually started way back in 2010 in a German town, which I'm not even gonna try to pronounce. And they got straight to work. Shortly after forming in 2010, they released a self-titled EP that was pretty much in the style of that attack attack asking alexandria type of metalcore also known as crab core that was blowing up at the time And listening to it now, it's obviously not as good as the stuff that they're putting out these days, but honestly, it's pretty damn good for a brand new 2010 metalcore band. Definitely not bad at all. And from the very beginning, the essence of the band was there. Even back then, they were leaning into the fun lyrics about partying, although their lyrics were not quite as wholesome as they are these days. Instead of being the goofy wigs and the silly dancing and jokes about German culture that they do these days, it was quite a bit more raunchy. More on that later. Let's get this party started. Got the feeling right Take a picture on this one that have a sex tonight they also did a cover of California Girls by Katy Perry, which was kind of a modest breakout success for them. And the first time I heard them was I think in 2011 when I saw the music video for their song Is Anyone Up? And for anybody who isn't familiar, the title of the song is a reference to isanyoneup.com, run by a guy named Hunter Moore that you may have heard of. And if you somehow haven't heard of this site, it was a short-lived but super popular revenge porn site kind of centered around like the emo, metalcore, post-hardcore kind of scene where people would anonymously submit photos of ex-girlfriends, boyfriends, and even a lot of band members. And there's a whole Netflix documentary about that called The Most Hated Man on the Internet 
internet if you want to hear the whole story. That's really beside the point. What I'm trying to get at here is that I find it really interesting how much darker and edgier this era of the band was. And to be clear, I'm not trying to cancel them or anything like that. I don't think they had any kind of malicious intentions or anything. I think it was just a fun song. And I'm sure if you ask them now, they would not endorse Hunter Moore or that site. But my point is that even from the very beginning of the band, they were leaning into the idea of these like really over the top lyrics and these like goofy videos that had the potential to go viral. Like even the fact that me, an American, saw this video by a random German metalcore band in 2011 tells you that they did something right. And I remember coming across them back then and thinking that it was kind of funny that there was this German band that sort of sounded like Attack Attack and was writing these like goofy songs about is anyone up? And never in a million years would I have guessed that a decade later, they would be one of the most popular bands in metalcore. And capitalizing on that success, they actually did a US tour in 2013, which was their first and only American tour to date. And they followed that up with their second album in 2014 called We Are The Mess, which was pretty much along the same lines of Attack Attack style crabcore with lyrics about partying. And I could be wrong, but I don't recall this getting a whole lot of traction in North America, although it did do well in Europe. It actually hit number eight on the charts in Germany and had a feature by Deuce from Hollywood Undead. They followed that up with their third album, Crystals and The Scene in 2017, which had a feature from Franz of Attila and somewhat of a hit or at the very least a fan favorite with MC Thunder. And again, both of those albums did really well in Europe with both of them hitting number six on the German charts. And at this point, they were routinely playing to like one or 2000 people a night on headlining tours, which for comparison is actually about the same size as the recent Sum 41 and Simple Plan tour that I saw here in America. Also, I'm not sure how this happened, but somehow or another, their drummer David actually ended up winning the German version of The Bachelor in 2017, which gave them a really nice boost in mainstream awareness. Jessica Pasca entscheidet sich im Finale für den 27-jährigen David Friedrich. Der Musiker sticht die beiden letzten Kandidaten Johannes und Niklas auf. And they continue to just kind of slowly but surely level up. In 2019, they released their fifth album, Rehab, which to me really felt like it was a step up in terms of songwriting. But again, as far as I remember, the band didn't really get a ton of traction in America. And with all due respect, I would say that their music was just sort of middle of the pack at this point. Certainly nothing bad by any means, but not exceptional. And looking at the band at this point in time, they seem like one of the many European bands that did great in their home country and region, but probably weren't going to cross over in terms of having any success in North America, which to be clear, they seem perfectly fine with and for good reason. They'd only done that one American tour, but they were hitting the top 10 in Germany, playing headlining shows and festivals to thousands of people in Europe. Who needs America, right? But as most of you probably know, that was about to change. And the catalyst to their big breakthrough was actually the departure of their original vocalist, Sushi. And from what I understand there, the main problem there was just that they could never really get on the same page musically. That it was really just like a constant fight in the studio. Here's what their other vocalist, Kevin, had to say about it. It didn't have anything to do with friendship or anything. Anything. It was more in terms of the way that we were working together and actually getting along in the studio. So when we went back in the studio again and were on our own, we could do whatever we liked and not have any compromises along the way. It felt so natural and it was just so good to write music again. And I find this really interesting because in most cases, losing a vocalist slash frontman is usually kind of a death blow for a band. Most bands never recover from that. But in this case, it actually proved to be exactly what they needed to grow, to allow themselves to be creative creative again and just like enjoy making music together. And so with Sushi out of the band, they held online auditions, got a bunch of submissions and eventually chose someone named Nico Salik based on his cover of their song Prism. And they didn't waste any time getting back to work. They quickly went back into the studio with the new lineup and came out with the song that would change everything for them, Hypa Hypa, which came out in June of 2020. 
And if you pay attention to quote unquote metal YouTube, which you probably do if you watch my videos, you'll remember that this song was just all over the internet that summer. I remember just like all of a sudden tons of people DMing me about it. And I was like kind of confused. I was like, wait, Eskimo Cowboy, the band that did that Is Anyone Up song 10 years ago? Clearly, I was out of the loop because that is the summer that they really kind of took over the internet. The song quickly racked up tens of millions of views. And with that, Electric Cowboy was part of the conversation in North America in a way that they really just never had been before. And this is probably a good time to talk about exactly why that happened. Number one, first and foremost, this song is just dramatically better than anything else they had done before. Like I said, their old stuff was certainly good, but this song was on another level. It was still that same kind of mix of metalcore and European dance music that they'd always been doing, but this time they sort of added a little touch of almost like boy band kind of vocals, and most importantly, it had a really, really, really catchy chorus, like the kind of thing you just can't get out of your head. I will admit that I found this song kind of annoying the first time that I heard it, but I also just kind of randomly found myself singing the chorus in the shower or whatever, and I was like, okay, maybe there is something here, because after all, isn't that ultimately the sign of a great song that you just can't get it out of your head? And it's kind of the same story with the video. They'd been doing these kind of like silly, fun videos since the very beginning of the band, but this was just executed much better than anything else they had done. It was so well done that it honestly felt like something you might see on Saturday Night Live. And this wasn't because they invested a bunch of money in it or anything like that. It's just because they'd been doing this for 10 years, improving their craft, getting a little bit better with every video, and all those little improvements added up over time into what you saw with this video. So ultimately, I think of it like this. Yes, they'd been a band for 10 years at this point, but it felt like Hypa Hypa, the song and the video, was when they really truly realized the vision that they had set out on a decade earlier. And I think another factor here is timing. I think I speak for everyone when I say that 2020 was, to put it bluntly, a fucked up year. Between COVID and riots and wildfires and just all the other stuff going on that year, it was rough. People were looking for an escape and this song was a perfect distraction. And I think it sort of made people ask the question of like, why does metal have to be so serious all the time? Like, are we as metal fans not allowed to have fun? Are metal and fun mutually exclusive? I don't think they are. It's just one of these kind of unwritten rules that people seem to just kind of blindly follow, but I think that their popularity is proof that that is just not true. People were ready for it. And I think it was also kind of like just the perfect fit for Reaction YouTube, which was also exploding in 2020. And you see that that's kind of a common thread in a lot of the newer bands that I've talked about. And so it's pretty crazy to think about how powerful reaction channels are with what they've done for bands like Ginger, Polyphia, and Lorna Shore, just to name a few. And they are smart guys who understand that. So knowing the power of reaction channels, they've also posted several videos of them reacting to reactions, which gave people even more incentive to do reactions, hoping that the band would choose their next time. Very smart. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna live the world with this. Fucking locomotive, <laughs> <laughs> And so I think that the common thread in everything that they do really just comes down to creativity. A really great example of this to me is when they announced Nico as their new singer. Most bands would just put out some kind of boring press release filled with the usual kind of PR speak, like we are very excited to welcome so-and-so as the newest member to our band, blah, 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 which zero people are gonna get excited about, right? But with Electric Cowboy, they went the extra mile and made it fun. So here is a... So, was kann man machen, weiß ich nicht. Ja, ich hätte mir vorgestellt, weil das ja so ein Wahnsinnstyp ist, also so ein Kinotrailer, sag ich mal so. They also do a lot of vlogs, which I can't understand because I don't speak German, but it almost doesn't matter if you can understand them or not, because what comes through is the feeling. You just get the sense that they're really funny guys who are just like super chill dudes that you'd want to be friends with. <lacht> But with all of that being said, we can't just say that the success of Hypa Hypa came down to good timing or luck. They had very clearly leveled up as a band and they proved that by following up Hypa Hypa with two other singles called We Got The Moves and Pump It, both of which were just as catchy as Hypa Hypa. Personally, I think We Got The Moves is their best song.
And both of them have equally brilliant videos that are both over 10 million views. So they've really cemented themselves as a band that just doesn't miss. But there's something else about the band that's actually the most interesting aspect of Electric Cowboy to me. Their screamer Kevin said in an interview around that time that this was their most mature stuff, which might sound kind of weird because we're talking about these ridiculous songs where they're wearing the mullet wigs and stuff in the videos. But actually, I think it's true. In my personal opinion, the old stuff with Sushi was a little bit try hard. It felt like they were really just kind of trying to be edgy for the sake of being edgy. And I'll talk more about that later. But with Nico, it's different. It feels like they're still having fun and being creative, but without the sort of sense of being edgy or trying too hard that I got from some of their earlier stuff. And so I will admit that I was kind of wrong about them. I had kind of written them off as like a jokey comedy metal band because I kind of only knew their big viral singles. But what I realized after digging a little bit deeper is that number one, they actually do have quite a few kind of more serious, substantial songs like Hate Love. But also, if you listen to interviews with them, they actually seem like really insightful, thoughtful guys. I think the perfect example of that is what went down last year when they were still called Eskimo Callboy, and they announced that they were considering changing their name. And for context, for those who may not be aware, Eskimo is kind of considered a slur, or at the very least, a very kind of tacky, outdated word by many, but not all, Alaskan natives. It's kind of like saying Indian instead of Native American. And to be clear, I'm sure the band had absolutely no idea about that back in 2010 when they came up with the name, being that they were German teenagers, and back then, even very few Americans knew that. So to be totally clear, I'm not trying to cancel them or anything like that. It's actually quite the opposite. I think that they just sort of realized that they'd come up with a name that, unknown to them, was actually kind of offensive to some people. And with the band now being far more popular and a lot of people in America kind of discovering them, people also found some of their older lyrics, which were you know, let's just say not great. And at first I was like, all right, how bad could these possibly be? What are people upset about? And then I read some of them and I was like, okay, yeah, that is not great. <laughs> And it's actually not even just one song. There's quite a few others, for example, Too Fat, Too Furious. But my point here is not actually to drag up all that stuff because it's very obvious to me that those are just edgy jokes that they made a long time ago, which just didn't represent who they were or where their heads are at now as guys in their 30s. And so in light of all that, they announced that they were changing their name to Electric Cowboy and taking some of those older songs off of streaming services. And I think that the way that they announced it really tells you a lot about where they're coming from and made me really see the band in a different light as far as being much more thoughtful people than I realized. Here's what they had to say. We can't live without fun and irony, but of course there are limits to that. We apologize to everyone we've discriminated or hurt with our lyrics. That was never our intention. That's why we are already in the midst of taking these songs offline. We are a tolerant and open-minded band and against any form of racism and exclusion. Our music should be as much fun for all of you as it is for us, but of course you can still think we suck. And and a lot of people said that that was the band caving into pressure from, you know, the woke SJWs or whatever. But I don't think that's true at all. I think that they sincerely felt bad about saying things that came across as much more hateful than they intended. And I think they just wanted to make it right. And the reason I say that is because I think they definitely could have said, you know what? Fuck you. We're not changing anything. Fuck cancel culture. And I think their fans would have stood by and supported them just the same. In fact, if anything, I think they opened themselves up to even more criticism by making the change. And so I actually really respect that they did what they thought was right and took the risk of changing the name and taking those other songs offline. And as somebody who has also said a lot of extremely stupid shit online over the years, I also appreciate that they've evolved. And you should be too, because I'm willing to bet that a lot of you have probably also said some dumb shit and wouldn't we all want the chance to be forgiven for that? And so just like with Ice Nine Kills and Lorna Shore only really hitting their stride 10 or 15 years into their career, I find it it's super inspiring to see them hit this level of success after a full decade of being a band. So if you ever feel like it's too late to make a change in your career or life because you're too old, like your dream is never going to come true and the days of even having a dream are behind you, if you're feeling defeated or frustrated because you've been working towards something for years and years and years without ever really finding that breakthrough, let Electric Callboy be your example that that is just not true. It is never too late, so don't give up and go make it happen.
All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. Check out my Spotify playlist at the link in the description. And also, I would like to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. It is because of your support that I'm able to do this full time. And my patrons get all my podcasts a week early. I do some giveaways, do other stuff. And there's also a way to have me review your music live on Twitch. Every month, I do a call for submissions. If you want me to check it out, all you need to do is drop it in the comments of that post. Then I will review it live on Twitch and post it on Patreon for everyone to see. So if that sounds cool, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time. I will see you next time.